Hello! Welcome to the Delicious Legacy Podcast. My name is Thomas Dinas. And today's guest is Dr. Eleanor Yanega. And we will talk about women, beer and cheese in medieval Europe. Thank you! Welcome! Well, thank you so, so much for having me. Um, I've got some beers there. Yeah, look at these, yeah. Um, Oh, these are all these are all nice beers. I love this. Yes, yes, all good beers. Um, I'm a sucker for Belgian beers, like in a real, <laughs> real way, um, which I'm not supposed to say as a Czech, right? We're not supposed to admit. <laughs> we're never supposed to admit that other people never, have no, good the, beer. The no, tick, mm, no. Mm, but uh, what can I say? I just love a Belgian beer. So <laughs> make sure you cut that. <laughs> But yeah, it's um, uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting about uh, Belgian beers is how they are kind of close to older recipes and how, you know, you do have these traditions that are linked, you know, specifically to the monastery or just, you know, like to the method or whatever and how, how seriously they take it, which is great. Very, very good, in my opinion. Awesome. And then some ales. ales yeah, yeah, but I mean, I couldn't find unhopped tales, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, it's but, so hard now, yeah, right? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Which is so funny. Um, you find these... Uh, records from when hops starting to come in here in England where people are like calling hops like the devil's plant and all this stuff and they're like oh you shouldn't hop your ale it's uh it's like evil and it's a it's a product of satan and all and like you know people are using it over in Belgium and stuff like that and here they're like no no <laughs> it's uh, there were like laws about it for a while they were like don't you dare use hops it's quite funny like yeah so in Europe they used hops yeah earlier so you know kind of like late medieval early modern you start to see the hops coming in um and so you find it especially in kind of the lowlands so yeah like you mm. know um around in what is now Belgium and the Netherlands and so that's kind of how English people learn about it obviously because of all the links with the wool trade and yeah. stuff um, but then when they want to bring it over to here, there's a real big pushback against it being kind of, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> evil. Um, they're like, I think the idea is that they think hops make it like more alcoholic somehow. Right. Or something like that. And it, it, it's also interesting to me because it's like, you know, everyone has, everybody's culture has like the story about like, oh, there's this one booze that like, oh, that booze is a really strong one and people just go crazy for a bit. Like, um, when I was living in Australia, there's this particular kind of rum that I really like called Bundaberg rum that is made from the sugar cane in far north Queensland, right? And Australians would be like, oh, that's that's fighting juice. That's crazy juice. People just drink uh, Bundaberg and they go nuts and they act like real assholes. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, this doesn't even make sense because I was I, and I was always drinking it. I was like, what do you mean? Yeah. And it just really reminds me of kind of like the English thing with hops because I'm like, I think you've just kind of created a narrative that allows you to drink it and then act like a jerk. Do you know what I mean? Like, because yeah, they're like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then people just act like jerks when they drink beer with hops in it. Like, what are you, what? No. So. <laughs> and drunken Englishmen act like uh, idiots since uh, the 16th century. Oh, no, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> with impunity. Yeah. Hmm, some of that around. What can I say, you know? Right. So, would you like to yeah, we don't... start with? Well, yeah, what should we start with? Um, Maybe we should start with the goes yeah. because it just it would like in terms of this more sour flavor profile, then yes. we can work towards the yeah. darker. Okay. Try that. <laughs> Love that. So I like Goza. Do you like Goza? Question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> See, I, I like um I like lambics and I like sours. Great. So um so for me, I'm like, oh, this is a nice time. But uh <laughs> You know, a lot of other people I know are not hugely into it. Here you go. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes. I, I mean, it's with the mood, I think. I think most of the times I like it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that it really depends, too. I think that when you're talking about, like, the Belgian gazes, I'm like, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that right. I don't speak Flemish, okay? But <laughs> no, yeah, cheers. <laughs> cheers. Mm. See, that's very good, in my opinion. It's it got, nice. Yeah. I like Very um, nice. What I like about Goes is it's got that kind of um, farmyardy quality. Mm. So it kind of reminds me of straw and apples and things like that. Even though I think with these just a regular old Goes, which we're having now, it doesn't. It's not fruited in any way. Yeah. So you know there are all those other Belgian lambics that also have fruit, which I'm a huge fan of as well. But. Um, I mean, I really, I'm really into lambics, and one of the reasons I'm into lambics, other than the fact that they're delicious, is because they are using this really old fermentation process. 
Um, and it is, I think it might technically be early modern, uh, but it, it wouldn't be completely out of the question to see it necessarily uh, in the medieval period. So it relies on wild yeasting. So if you go to um, various breweries that make lambic, so for example, if you ever go to Brussels, you can go to the Cantillon Brewery and uh, have a look. And they just have these big open vats that are huge and rectangular and like the size of a couple of rooms. And they're just sitting around waiting for yeast for to yeast. kind of yeah. just, be just like, Hey, where's the yeast? We're here. <laughs> and I find that something about it really, um, really fun, like really sweet. You know, it, it's kind of much more, um, it, it's almost like a, a magical thinking kind of way of doing yeah. it. It's just like sitting around and waiting for the yeast to arrive. I really dig that as opposed to, to adding it in. And um, it's cute because sometimes there'll be, like spider webs and stuff, and they say, you know, mm. you, you have to keep the spiders in because otherwise there's a huge problem with fruit flies. Yes, of course. Yeah, of it's course. When you're doing, yeah. when you're doing um, uh, the open fermentation, and so they say, yeah, the, the spiders are like the brewer's best friends when you're making lambic. But I really think lambic is so interesting because it is this old style thing, and we're still making it in the same way, and I think that's really valuable and interesting. Yeah. And also it's good. <laughs> so <how about> <laughs> Mostly it's good, but also valuable. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, so that's the thing. It's like you wouldn't keep making it in the same way if it sucked, right? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, maybe you would. I don't know. Like, come on. But Brewers, mm. you, you never know. They have weird habits. That's true. That's true. <laughs> not, I'm not trying to insult brewers, but come on, guys. Uh, what can I say? Yeah, I mean, one thing I, that I suppose about Lambic, though, that might mean that it is uh, slightly more early modern than medieval, though, is it is quite... Um, uh, Petillon, right? It's got like it, it's bubbly. Mm, okay. So, so, so basically, with medieval beer, it was. It tends to be more like ale. It does tend to be flatter, and in general, you know, we we would say that they make ale, right? Beer mm. does come in in the late medieval period and the early modern period, but for the most part, you see ale, and what and what they're drinking is ale. Mm. They just don't. They don't have hops yet. They don't have like all of these other ways of kind of um, of. This, this is great. Uh, yeah, I'm really on fire over here. Um, that, preserving. Preserving. Sorry. There you go. Right? Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what hops do, right? That's, hops hops preserve, preserve Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, it's interesting because they drink a lot of ale. They make a lot of ale. But obviously one of the issues with ale is you have to make it all the time. Mm. Right? And it doesn't uh, transport well. Um, you know, it's kind of like, well, you've got a couple of weeks to, to drink this. Um and, you know, it, it's interesting as a result because there, there's a kind of, like, gendered thing mm -hmm. about this. Because, um, you know, in the medieval period, a lot of the time, brewing is associated with women. You know, like, so it's something that women do. Um, and we'll see that, you know, brewing the ale in your own house is just kind of, like, another thing that you do. And, it, you know, you're keeping the potters going on the fire, right? You are doing the animal husbandry. You're doing whatever else. But you're also making the ale all the time. Right. And so there can then be, you know, a cottage industry on top of that where you make extra and you, you sell it at the market. You don't just make enough for your household. And then even um, it kind of gets kicked up even to a next level. So, for example, we will find often that um, rich women will have breweries. So say you're a lady of some description. You might have a brewery in your big old house where you've got a bunch of people working who are often, again, women. Like, you hire women in, uh, to do the brewing. And then uh, they can sell ale in much larger quantities. But it's usually res like referred to as being overseen by the lady and not the man of the household. So, like, that would be a specific thing for a household manageress, not, not the dude. Um, but then... When you see beer coming in, you start to see changes there because, like, suddenly, right, well, beer really keeps. You can really transport beer to, like, over long distances, and it starts becoming a slightly more masculine thing. And, you know, I'm not saying that men didn't brew in the medieval period. They absolutely did. It's just that it's one of the few professions that we see where there's a lot more parity and, indeed, yeah. like, women outrank men. men. A lot of the time. Mm. So there definitely are men who are involved. We see men, for example, get in trouble. It, one of the big things that people get in trouble for in the medieval period is brewing terrible beer. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's uh, So um, interestingly, the, you know, the ducking stool 
that, you know, it's a, a big thing in the early modern period as well, goes back to the medieval period, and it used to just be called the cucking stool. Um, and it started out as just, like, a chair that people that you would have to, like, sit in in front of your house if you made bad beer, and everyone would come by and be like, hey, your beer sucks! You know? <laughs> and you'd have to sit there and get yelled at by everyone in the chair, right? And it was, like, specifically linked to making bad beer or sometimes selling bad bread. And so we have these records of people who are just like terrible brewers because it's like because they'll get taken to court. Everyone's like they're selling bad beer, and they're like, no, like, we can't they be having this. Yeah, you know, we like, cannot allow this. Yes. Yeah, and so like, you'll see. <laughs> so we ha- we know a lot about brewers because they're all also getting in trouble when they suck all the time. <laughs> so you're like, oh, okay, right. Was that usually men? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's interesting because you you see men come up. I'd say so in the, like off the top of my head, the cases I know, men are probably about a third of it. It's probably a two-thirds women and a third men. Mm-hmm. Something like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> Damn, we can't blame men mm-hmm. for that. So, and it, yeah, it's, um, it's just one of those things where it's funny because now when we think about beer, we think about it as being a real dude's thing. Yeah. It's yeah. like, you know, oh, yeah, dudes with beards and, like, whatever else. And insert your own cliche here. But, you know, from a medieval standpoint, like, this is women's stuff, right? So, <laughs> um, so yeah. Middle Ages, Medieval Times, Dark Ages. I mean, do they all refer to the same kind of period? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Great question. Um, So if you ask a medieval historian, and you're talking about the term Dark Ages, what we will say is that that means specifically the early medieval period. Um, So early medieval, like, what does that mean? Eh, I don't know, like maybe before the year 800. You know, like kind of before the Carolingians come around. Um, Because the Carolingians... Uh, kick off a thing that we call the Carolingian Renaissance, where there become there happen to be a lot more texts. Because when we use the term Dark Ages, what the Dark Ages was supposed to mean <laughs> was um, it, com- it comes from Caesar Baronius's term the Saclum Obscurum, which he coined in the 17th century to refer to a lack of texts. Um, so when we as medieval historians use it, we mean well, we don't have a whole lot of texts to go on, right? There just aren't a lot of sources uh, around the shop. So we mean dark as in like occluded like i can't see it i, I don't well, yeah. well who knows what they were doing because we just don't have the stuff um which is really funny too because what, what i've told random people that because they think dark ages just means bad <laughs> uh, and when i've told people that i've had people say oh yeah well if it wasn't a bad time why did they burn all the books and i'm like excuse Whoa. me like what? <laughs> where did you even get that idea like so if the books don't the, if the books don't survive from like 1400 years ago somebody burnt them it, yeah. it, it, which is just insane right it's like why would you why would you say that you know keep a book for 10 years in your house and then tell mm-hmm. me how well it's surviving mm-hmm. in your house 10 years in modern time modern books and it's like falling apart you know what why are you going to keep like every single tax record from a thousand years ago you don't necessarily care you know and you know people's buildings fall apart people move places you don't take things you know, and yeah, yeah. so the only stuff that really survives to us in terms of texts from those periods is like the fanciest, like the fanciest and nicest stuff. So you'll see them and you'll be like, ooh, it's very nice, you know, but like we're not going to have someone's private correspondence, like the letters that they wrote back and forth, because like what, who, who is keeping these things, right? It's just not of um, any interest to them. So uh, that's what Dark Ages is supposed to mean. But unfortunately, people have come to believe it refers to the entire medieval period. And also, unfortunately, people don't even know what the medieval period is. So they'll just be like, you'll hear people like talking about, you know, the 17th century, right? For example, when this beer comes from, and they'll be like, oh, the medieval period. And it's like, no, bro, no. like, <laughs> absolutely not. You know, or, oh, the dark ages, you know, like, I saw some idiot the other day talking about, um, <laughs> very unfortunately, our, our friends in Madagascar are having a really hard time right now. And they're having um, a famine because of uh, basically the trouble with global warming. And uh, someone said, oh, yeah, they're living in medieval conditions. And it's like, in what way? <laughs> like, they're experiencing a uniquely modern problem that is a result of modern oh stuff God. that we've done most modernly, right? And it's, um, you know, people will just throw out the term to mean, uh, you know, they're having a crap time. And it's like, well, sure, bad things happen in the medieval period like every other time. But it wasn't uniquely bad or in any way, shape or form, you know? Yeah, Exactly. If you had beer and wine, then... It can't sure, be that bad. Yeah, it can't be that bad, yeah. <laughs> the only dark thing they had it was uh, the beer, probably. Mm-hmm, yeah. yeah. Probably darker beer, mm. has to be said. Um, <laughs> so this is 
uh, I, I, allegedly, and I'm, I'm stealing this from the bottle. I don't know this, everybody. Just <laughs> be clear. I sure can read a bottle, though. But um, in theory, this recipe has been going on since the 17th century. So this is from like a 1679. So obviously that's going to vary from, you know, what a strictly medieval recipe would be. Because so it's uh, it, it is quite funny, too, when you see images of beer from the time. A lot of the time it is specifically dark mm. like if someone bothered to draw it somewhere and you're like oh interesting okay um but we do have like brewing recipes and things like that so we could in theory be making medieval ale now it's just that tastes have changed a lot you know yeah true true and everybody's what the last 10 years hops yeah they're pronounced yeah exactly and it's quite funny because from a medieval standpoint, you know, hops, like, just hops weren't on the scene for a, a really long time. It just wasn't anything that uh, people were brewing with, you know, which is the difference between uh, your ale and your beer. And uh, funnily enough, like when hops start coming in, some of the first uh, people who uh, take it up are, um, well, the Belgians. Uh, well, what, who we call the Belgians now, like a Belgians and Dutch people. Um, and Czechs also are like, this is great. <laughs> we're going to be having some of this. Thank you very much. Um and because there's this really big wool trade back and forth between here and the lowlands, um, and like we're all Hanseatic port cities, right? So we're they're in the Hanseatic League, which is basically a league that is just set up to trade wool. Because again, like again, I, yeah. I, I, I keep bringing wool up, but you know you have to, right? Uh, so um, people start coming. People are like coming over here. They're having beer. They're like, oh wow, look at this. Um, and someone says, oh, we should really get some of these hops back in England. And there's this, like, big moral panic about it. Like, no, you can't possibly. Don't, don't, don't bring the... And people will be referring to, like, the devil's hops. And it's, like, the devil's herb. And it will yeah. make you go crazy if you drink a beer that's hopped. And so sometimes we'll even see, like, laws against it being, like, specifically you cannot put hops in beer. And it's quite funny because it's not as though people didn't put stuff in ale. In the medieval period. And they're really into, for example, spicing things. So, like, they they like spices way more than we do. Um, you know, because it's a flex. <laughs> they're just like, look at that. Oh, I got some spices. You like that? You know, so, like, <laughs> they're, they're constantly trying to put, like, ginger into anything. You know, like, that's, <laughs> as far as they're concerned, that's the way forward, right? So, you'll, you'll see these uh, recipes for ale. And I'm sure it's good. And they're like, oh, yeah. And then you want to throw in some pepper. And you want to throw in some ginger. And you want to throw in. And it's just like, girl, what? What's going on with this beer? You know, and it might be, to us, we might be like, oh, nice little Christmas beer or something yeah, like that. Yeah. But uh, for them, they're like, yeah, oh, that's that. You can tell it's good because it's got a bunch of spices in it right so just the relationship to spice and the relationship to to ale and what it might be and taste like has really really changed and mm. so our, our tastes are not necessarily the same as theirs all of the time uh, but also we don't tend to have a moral panic about hops anyway. <laughs> i mean actually i guess maybe we do have a moral panic about hops you know whenever we're making fun of dudes for liking over hopped beers but i'm always making fun of people who like over hopped beers so you know it's what can I say? I'm from Seattle. We started it. We're the ones who started that whole. It's your fault, thing. isn't yeah, it? It is. It really <laughs> sucks. It's because our hop. We got those Cascade hops and the Chinook hops, and they're yeah. just like really, really hoppy. And what I always say about the overhop beers is I'm like, I think it's just beer for people who don't actually like yeah. beer or know anything about it. And they go, oh, uh, I can tell this beer is quote unquote good because, you know, you can really taste the hops, you know. Uh, so, yeah. And yeah, another misconception, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. I mean, like, so what's medieval, right? Um, mm. So... In theory, like the Middle Ages, right, goes from, quote unquote, the fall of Rome, Western Rome, which <laughs> je, which I don't believe happened. I want to be clear on that. I'm I'm a Rome didn't fall truther. Uh, <laughs> it, it's Constantinople is Rome. Shut up, everybody. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's not until Constantinople falls that Rome falls, in my opinion. But in theory, in 476, uh, when the Emperor Augustus is deposed, right, that's the beginning of the medieval period. Not that anybody knew. Yeah, uh, but you know, just... like in theory, and then it's like, well, what's the end? And no one can really say, mm. what, like, what the end is. It's sort of like, you know, maybe the end of the 15th century, maybe the beginning of the 16th century. We all kind of tend to agree that by the time you got a lot of Lutherans around, you've probably you're probably in the the early modern period. You're not That's, in like yeah. you know. Uh, the medieval period anymore, but you know maybe it's like Columbus going out there and being a dick. 
Yeah, yeah, you know? that that could be the start of uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> of like the it, early modern supposed time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. It's just, sorry, it's more of a vibe than anything <laughs> else. Uh, but you know, um, definitely by the time you get a real exchange going with the Americas, you're definitely um, in the early modern period. But you know, it's it's one of those difficult things because nobody at the time perceived of themselves as such, right? Yeah. So it's like, well, hard. Yeah, you travel across London for cheese, so... That's right, that's right. <laughs> so, you know, this is this is like, you know, not everyone can get me to make it to West London from South East London, but if you promise me cheese, I'll probably do it. I'm a, I'm, I'm a simple creature, what can I say? Same here, same here. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the more compelling arguments that there is, you know. But I also feel like, you know, if I am going to ride my bike an hour and a half somewhere, it's like, well... All the cheese I'm about to eat completely. Mm. Like, this is fine. I can just have that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Mm. Right. So what do what, we think? What beer is next? Hmm. <laughs> Should we try then this Camelite one? Yeah. What do you think about that? Okay. So. Go for it. Basically, uh, in medieval times, um, mm-hmm. we had... Either monks brewing beer or mm-hmm. women brewing mm-hmm. beer, mm-hmm. and obviously, like the the reason that monks do it as well is that beer is kind of considered absolutely essential for for life, and obviously, um, a because it rules. But you know, <laughs> yeah. the thing of it is, that there is a bit of a myth. There's a bit of a myth about the reason why people drank beer all the time is that like water was harmful and like full of sewage or something. Like well, water was probably better than. Than, yeah, than it is yeah, now, and yeah. they absolutely knew about boiling water and stuff. Like, it's like, calm down, everybody. It's yeah, like, it's one of my pet hates, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and how everybody always brings it up, right? So, I mean, the, the thing to keep in mind is when we talk about brewing, there absolutely is beer or ale that we w- that'll get you drunk. You know, that mm. is like our beer and ale, right? But the difference is that the great majority of what they're consuming is just small beer. And mm-hmm. they are drinking it kind of like in the way that we use energy drinks, mm-hmm. right? Because they're just like, they're out in the field, right? They're out there trying to bring in the turnip harvest. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. you, and it's really, really tiring. So they're drinking small beer all, all the time just in order to kind of keep their calorie intake up. Um, so you will see these records of people like drinking ale in the morning. And to us, that seems like, oh, well, that seems a bit sketchy, but that's, that's not what's going on. Right. Um, and so Obviously, the same thing kind of holds true within monasteries and nunneries, right? So they, they're doing the same kind of stuff. Um, and so they are going to need to have their own supply of beer and, in theory, right, when we think about nunneries and monasteries, the idea about them is you're supposed to be, like, leaving the world. Mm. So, like, when you become a monk, if you're, like, one of the enclosed kind, like, not if it's post-13th century and you're Franciscan, Franciscans are out in the world. But, um, so, for example, Benedictines. They're Mm -hmm. supposed to be behind the walls. They're supposed to be in their little monastery, and they are supposed to just be devoted to God and not a part of the generalized worldly everything. So, as a part of that, they're going to have their own breweries and things because they're supposed to be trying to be self-sufficient. So in theory, they're supposed to be doing their own gardening and their own farming and their own brewing. Um, in reality, <laughs> some of that starts to fall by the wayside, especially if um, some of the monasteries are quite wealthy. So it's going to be less likely that you're going to see a monk, for example, plowing. But it is really common that you'll see monks brewing, right? Because that's kind of pleasurable. Yeah. It's more of an interesting experience, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I would definitely rather be brewing beer than than plowing. You know, let's just put it that way. So, uh, <laughs> so that's why we get these great traditions of specific beers that come from monasteries and particular monasteries that are still making it. Mm. Because in order to be seen as self-sufficient, you needed to be making these things. Um, it's also true of wine. So if you are in one of the viniculture places, then they are often making their own wine as well. And interestingly, here in England, one of the reasons why we don't have much of a wine industry is because all of the wineries and all of the viniculture had been specifically connected to monasteries and nunneries. And so after Henry VIII abolished them all, Ah, then no one knew how to make it anymore. And it was like, oh, fuck. And so like, you know, they all just kind of like fell by the wayside. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a good nugget of knowledge that I didn't. No, obviously, the Romans brought vineyards yeah. and vines here, so they were. Yeah, 
And yeah. especially like around in Kent and things, um, there we do definitely have records of monasteries and nunneries who were making their own wine. Um, by all accounts, it was fine. Mm. You know, um, I think it was a bit more white wine here than it was red wine, mm. which makes sense. Um, but yeah, there, there certainly was English wine and we just lost it because Henry VIII is a jerk. So <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? You speak the truth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that guy. No, not a fan. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you with the welcome support of Malby and Greek, UK's leading Greek delicatessen. Malby and Greek also has some amazing Greek wines, which uh, you should try. And of course, um, some delicious Greek cheeses, which, again, they're underrepresented in the world scene. And um, apart from the most amazing feta you can find, uh, Malby and Greek has uh, other Greek cheeses, which are extremely difficult to find even in Greece. So you better not miss your chance to shop there, as I do, and get your hands into some amazing Greek produce. For all you lucky listeners of the Delicious Legacy podcast, Malby and Greek has an amazing discount, uh, which you can claim if you go to malbyandgreek.com forward slash delicious, uh, where you can get a 15% discount. Yep, that's right, 15% discount off your next purchase. Go forth and shop Greek. Malby and Greek is UK's leading Greek delicatessen, supplier and distributor of premium Greek products such as wine, herbs, cheeses, or olive oil, from all over the wild corners of the country, working directly with small artisan producers. Malby and Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. So we've got some interesting cheeses. What are these cheeses? Um, so this is sheep's milk cheese uh, called Bexwell mm-hmm. from um, Midlands. Mm. So try to find some old style traditional cheeses hard cheeses that would be mm-hmm. the kind of thing that you would more or less have yeah. you know five six hundred years ago and especially with sheep so mo- mo- they had lots of sheep back yeah. then and a, lo- a lot of <laughs> a lot of the yeah cheese, yeah yeah was mm-hmm. made by sheep's milk so i tried to find bexwell which is sheep's milk and then i've got cornish yarg Ooh, with I nettles love yarg. okay uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. and that's cheshire's Up- applebee's cheshire which is again they say that it's, it's a from the Roman times. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. Been made in Cheshire th- since the Roman times. But I'm going to yeah, try again. some of this, this sheep one. Yeah, that's probably the best one, I think. Mm. Mm. That's really nice, yeah. Mm. I feel like we don't... It's interesting because we still do farm a fair number of sheep here. Yeah. And, of course, in the medieval period, uh, sheep growing was one of the most important things about the island of Britain generally, um, is that we sure could grow some sheep here. (laughs) And um, wool is so incredibly important and it's such a huge cash crop that the major thing that was going on here was just kind of like, yeah, can you grow more sheep, please, thanks. Obviously, there's going to be knock-on effects for, you know, eating mutton, um, yeah, using sheep cheese, things like that, that we don't really think about now, even though we still eat a fair amount of sheep Mm. here. I guess not as much as we should. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, if I remember well, uh, I read somewhere about a cheese wrapped in nettles from mm-hmm. medieval times. So that's that was the connection I had with um, <laughs> with a yarg. Yeah, yeah, I thought I'll, I'll buy some of that. Yeah, I do. I do like a yarg. I'm a sucker for a yarg. So alongside beer that uh, yeah. women were making quite a lot, women yeah. also did a lot of cheese. No. Yeah, a lot of cheese. Um, and people ate a lot of cheese, right? Which is why we're eating a lot of cheese now. And of course you would. And of For course historical would. context. Mm-hmm. Oh, obviously. Uh, yeah. yeah, that was the only reason. Um, <laughs> um, so cheeses and, and things are a really big part, like a staple part of most medieval people's diets. Um, same kind of reason that they drink a lot of beer. It's a really good to have a kind of high fat thing that keeps well, that you can transport with you. So you're going on... Um, uh, trip somewhere because you've got to sell something at market or something like that, or maybe you're on pilgrimage. Cheese lasts, right? You can just wrap a cheese up in a cloth and bring it with you and you're good to go. You don't really have yeah. to worry about refrigerating it. It will just be fine, right? So it's a kind of like really all-purpose, storable thing. And also you can make it at home fairly easily. 
So you don't need to have like a huge production mm. that is like constantly churning it out. Um, and you probably, if you're a peasant and, and you are a peasant, right? <laughs> so like 85% of the European population in the medieval period are peasants of some description or another. Um, 70% of those are serfs, so they're unfree. The other 15% are free um, and maybe they're just rich, which is possible. Like you could be a peasant and rich, completely, completely doable. Um, but you probably have some cows. Because, you know, you're going to want milk and you'll want to make your own cheese. You definitely have sheep if you're somewhere like here because that's the entire point is having some sheep rip. So you're going to be doing a lot of milking in general and you're probably not actually going to get through all of the milk in and of itself. So what do you do? You make cheese. Yeah, exactly. So <clears throat> it's like one of these specifically kind of feminized jobs right. is the cheese making. Um and it's interesting because, you know, you go, when you look at how jobs shake out on the farm, it's really funny because, like, the great majority is like, yeah, women did that. Yeah, women did that. Yeah, women did that. And you're like, oh, man. I was like, going to say that. I mean, what did men do? <laughs> Plowed. Plowed. Okay. You know, and, and this isn't to say that women didn't plow. Like, they certainly did. But, you know, um, you'll, you'll tend to see men doing more things like... Uh, mm, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to go. Oh, getting in like the the firewood in, you know, stuff like a cu cutting up logs and yeah. stuff. That tends to be like men's work. Uh, sometimes slaughtering animals, a, a bit more men's work. Although we have depictions of men and women like working together on that one. So, um, for example, in the labors of the months, which is a, a particular art motif that you see a lot in the medieval period where people will show, you know, January through December and they're like, here's the thing you do in this month. Um, and granted, they're really idealized. They're like super romantic. They're like, oh, look at all the happy peasants in the field, you know, or like, or whatever. Um, and in December, the thing that people do is slaughter pigs. And so sometimes it's just men slaughtering the pigs, but oftentimes you, you also see women in there as well. So like the woman's kind of like holding often a dish underneath the pig's throat to get the blood. Um, so, like, within these, like, maybe men do a bit more of, yeah, like, uh, kind of when you're, th well, women thresh too. Ah, you know, it's really, really hard to say. Well, we have you know? to, yeah, we have to talk about women. Cause... Yeah, because it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. But, yeah, I suppose, like, in, like, the August and things when it's, like, time to kind of mow the hay, sometimes men are more frequently shown with size. Mm. And women are the ones who are kind of, like, bundling the the grass together and that sort of thing so there, there are gendered ways that things shake out but women do so much work on the farm that you'll see for example polemical texts that are written to try to dissuade women from marriage right and they'll be like okay. don't don't get married because um you should join the church because we're doing all that work yeah exactly yeah. yeah so you should what you really want to do is you don't want to get married you don't want to have sex you don't want to become sinful like turn towards god girl <laughs> and uh, one of the things that, that you'll see is you'll see these things that are like, oh, well, you know, what happens when you come in from, you know, a hard day on the farm and your calf, because like the animals kind of sleep in another part of the same house as, and the, oh, and the calf has got out and he's in the kitchen and your baby is screaming and the dog is trying to get into the potage and your husband is grumbling and you've got to get like, and your loaf is burning on the fire. And it's, and it's just like, here's all these things that women do, right? It's that women tend to look after the animals. Women are looking looking after children women are baking the bread women are keeping the food going and a part of that is the cheese production right yeah. so that's going to be something that's always kind of in the back ongoing uh because it is such a long process you know to uh ferment the well is ferment the right way word for cheese no surely not what, what do we call it cure i don't know I don't know when ferment. you ferment, ferment. Yeah, ferment. You, know, you know when you make the milk go sour and the hey hey you know and then you gotta and you have to what what you have got to get the rennet out uh, from with the curds and whey and then you kind of have to mix that back together and there's all kinds of different cheese that they would make and eat so you know you have kind of like farm cheese like what we would call cottage cheese or like the quick cheeses um, then you also have like the harder cheeses things like this but they just eat a lot of cheese because. It's so it's something that you can make and it's going to be so useful for you when you're doing a million jobs on the farm. Right. Yeah. So yeah. what can I say? Well done, women. Oh. They were multitasking uh, since uh, I know. the Middle Ages. Things. Every time I look at it, I'm like, yeah, it does. I'm like, maybe I am going to become a nun. Damn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I guess that doesn't sound good. You're right. Wow. OK. So did the, I mean, maybe that's a bit irrelevant question mm. for you, but how did we end up in a modern, more modern 
post-industrial society that kind of mm. we erased that part of history from that the women been very important in terms of economic output. That's a really I, that's a really good question. Um, one of the things that I have to and I've just written a book about this. <laughs> so, so plug the, like, the book. <laughs> yeah, okay, the book. It'll it'll be out this time next year. It is called The Once and Future Sex. Um, it is specifically about um, medieval expectations about women. And so I've got an entire chapter about like women working, right? Um, and part of the reason that we kind of ignore women working is that we just assume women to be working. Like in the medieval period, it, it was obvious that women would be doing all this work, right? So, you know, peasant women, they're doing all this work. Um, there will be, you know, kind of middle class women who will have jobs like being bakers or brewers or things like that. And, you know, or in cities like London, for example, women who are attached to guilds. Now, a lot of the time they can't join a guild themselves. You know, guilds being kind of like a cross between a union and a protection racket, right? Yeah. So yes. it's like, yeah. you know, you can't just no, you can't just sell spice in London, right? You have to be a part of the grocers' union. Okay. Gro oh, sorry, grocery not, not union. <laughs> sorry, grocers' guild. Uh, and in, in order to be allowed to do that. And now women are usually not allowed in most guilds, though there are exceptions to this. So, for example, silk making is seen as like being explicitly feminine a lot of the time. And there'll be whole guilds of silk makers that are just women. Or sometimes women can be kind of grandfathered into guilds if their husband was a member of the guild and their husband dies. Right. So then the wife, basically the guild membership transfers over to the wife unless she remarries and then at which point in time it's taken off of her again. Um, and what that should tell you is that women are doing pretty much the same work as the men who are in guilds and it's expected of them. So we'll see whole groups of families, for example, that um, just kind of like live on the same street in, in London and they're all members of the same guild. So like all the pepperers are living on one street or something like that. And, you know, you will marry the daughter of one of the pepperers down there because she's been brought up knowing how to do the books. Yeah. Like she's ready to like spring in and help you out. And Indeed, bookkeeping a lot of the time, that's an expressly feminine job. So it's like, oh, yeah, okay, well, so women women do that. And then, of course, at a level above that, again, you have stuff like nobles and royal women, and they're working too. Because it's like if what we say is that their job is diplomacy, then they're doing a lot of diplomacy, right? So, um, And they'll be involved in stuff like really high-level stuff with the church. They will do things like, you know, endow – churches and buildings and they do charity and they do they do all kinds of stuff like that. So one of the reasons we kind of don't think about women working is that it, it's just completely unremarkable. Right. From a medieval standpoint. It's just like, yeah, of course, of course women are working, right? Um, and then post-industrialization and post the Enlightenment, it's quite interesting because this new idea kind of comes in in the Enlightenment that, oh, like, if we look at the sexes scientifically, quote unquote, uh, which people love to do in the Enlightenment, it's a, like a spoiler, I'm just saying that it's not scientific. You're just trying to use science to justify what it is you want, right? But there becomes this big em emphasis, especially in like bourgeois circles, about how women and men um, are naturally separate and should be separate and they should be in separate realms. So men are kind of like scientifically supposed to be in the public sphere and out there doing businesses and things, whereas women should be in the private sphere and they should just be looking after their kids and being quiet. So you begin to see a retreat in the modern period of women in bourgeois spaces from mm. like from business, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, again, like the women who would have been, you know, working alongside guilds, suddenly they're not doing that anymore. They're in the back with the kids. Um, but having said that, for working class women, like the the clues in the name, <laughs> like they're, they're still working. They're still working. They're still yeah. working the whole <laughs> time. And, you know, for upper class women, it, things remain much the same. You know, you still see women really involved in charities. You still see women really involved in, you know, in, in things like that. So, um it's interesting because it's sort of like a middle class way of looking at what women and men should be doing. And the reason then that women are not perceived to be working is because like, oh, well, poor people don't count. Right? Like, who's writing about them? I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah you're yeah, like, oh, yeah. they're not, that's not people, right? <laughs> so, you know, you don't need to be thinking about, like, all of the women who are working in factories now, right? Yeah. And who are, who are the ones who are sitting behind the spinning jenny or whatever and making cloth, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and then in kind of like a post-World War II consensus in the 20th century in the global north, you do have this like really brief period of time where you have an expanding middle class that it's kind of um, – a lot of times specifically egged on by grants from the government and things like that. So suddenly you will have women who are staying at home because there's enough money off of one wage to make that happen. And it's, but it's kind of aspirational. It's like, Oh look, we're being middle-class like wait, yes. Cause you know how women don't work. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And so middle-class women are still kind of like not working there. So it's interesting because when we are like, Oh, well women have finally made it back to the workplace. It's like, well, women have been in the workplace <laughs> the whole time. Like you yeah. just don't care about maids. Right yeah. or nannies or or, or you know yeah. or who's scrubbing the floor or who's going to the factory every day yeah and so when people tend to talk about that you know nebulously like oh quote unquote women in the workplace what they mean is like women in rich people jobs which yeah that definitely did go away but that's a specific modern phenomenon and it's not yes. even early modern it's like modern modern mm -hmm. it's like we're we're talking like 18th century onward so you yeah. know you wouldn't you wouldn't find like any Elizabethans being like, oh, yeah, women really shouldn't work. Like, it just doesn't make sense. It know? doesn't so, make yeah, sense. Yeah, 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 exactly. So that's a long answer. <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> Sorry. It's a good answer. Yeah, there yeah, you go. That's, yeah. that's how we like it. That's how we like it. Great. <laughs> I think you need to eat some cheese. I'm going to eat uh, some cheese. Yeah, I'm wearing some, myself out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need energy. <laughs> There's a lot more to follow. <laughs> oh, yeah. So this is good. we got um, some time, you know. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um... I'm just thinking about the next beer. Mm, yeah, what should we do for the next beer? Difficult situation to be in. So, Nick, yeah, Franciscan monks. More, yeah. So, this is a fun one. Let's, um, yeah. Apparently, I got this because it said the same recipe since the 14th century or something. Yeah, which so, uh, maybe it is. So, yeah. okay. Yeah, we should try that then. So, this, yeah. This is another. Uh, is this German, this one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. Is yeah. German. Obviously, the guys. Yeah, so it's called Franciscaner Weissbeer, and the Franciscaner there is a direct reference, obviously, to the Franciscans, right? So, yeah. uh, whomst I was just talking about. So, they're what you call a mendicant order, um, right? And it is, oh, yeah, I'll give you my glass. You can, you can give me some beer while I talk about this. M men can do some <laughs> um, So... Um, they, the Franciscans kind of come up in the 13th century with St. Francis of Assisi, um, and they're kind of like one of the last orders that really gets allowed in um, because, you know, the church really tightly regulates who can be groups of monks and who can't because they don't like they're just trying to keep an eye on you because people will wild out in the middle ages you know people will be all like yeah this is our order like we're a religious order and we're all living in the woods half naked and the church is like I feel like no. Like, I'm not, I'm gonna say, yeah. we're cutting that one off, right? So, um, but the Franciscans are kind of allowed to because, A, in the first place, it would have been really difficult to tell them no because everybody really liked them. Everybody really liked St. Francis of Assisi. His uh -huh. deal, typical saint thing. He was born rich, um, I don't know, fopped around most foppily, womanized a lot, and then one day woke up and was like, ah, I love God, actually. Uh, what am I doing with my life? Yeah, exactly. And he's like, gives away all his stuff. He really commits to what we call apostolic poverty, so kind of trying to live like Jesus and the disciples. Mm. And his deal, unlike the monks that retreat behind walls and are just supposed to be living their life, um, and I mean, we love those monks, to be clear, because they're the ones who are like copying down all the manuscripts that we have. So good job, everybody. No notes. Love that. <laughs> um, but... The Franciscans, their deal is that they're out in the cities and they're expressly trying to work with people and preach. So there is this conception that we call um, like uh, pastoralism. So the idea that a, a priest is the, you know, the shepherd and mm. uh, their flock are these people who need to be educated about God. And um, the major way of doing that is seen as sermons, very specifically, and preaching. So Franciscans, a lot of the time, are responding directly to a desire on the part of individual people to have more sermons. Because, like, you know, like, they medieval people just like sermons. That's a really good time <laughs> for them. They're like, oh, yeah, baby, there's, like, a new <laughs> preacher came to town. Like, let's go hear him talk about God. And they really, I mean, by all accounts, that's really popular, right? So here's these guys... Everybody digs them because they're like, A, we're not going to be like the rest of the church. We're going to be poor, and that's going to be sort of our thing. B, we're working directly with people. And now, to be clear, then how they survive, 
right? Is the idea is that, oh, I'll give you a sermon and then you'll give me something in return. And it's like a gift exchange. Right. So like maybe okay. you'll give me money or maybe you'll give me food or something like that. Ironically, like Franciscans just end up becoming like as rich as any other group of like, like if I, a yeah, hundred years later, it's like, I think, you, yeah, yeah. You know, I see like a it's button. Like, yeah. Here. Yeah. Like it's, a hundred percent, like, a thing that happens in the medieval period is the church will be like, we're being holy, 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 holy. And then 150 years later, everyone is like, it seems like you're really rich and you're not holy. And they'll be like, oh, we're reforming, we're reforming, we're reforming. And then, like, 150 years later, everyone's like, seems like you're really rich again. And it just, like, keeps happening over and over again. So even though you've got, like, Franciscans who were supposed to be like, oh, yeah, I'm just, I'm poor and all I care about is, like, doing sermons. Like, by the 14th century... Uh, my boy, shout out to a legend, Jan Milic of Kromerzij, who is a big preacher in Prague. He hates Franciscans, right? Because he's like, they have so much money and they own half of Prague or whatever. And the Franciscans hate him and they like go to each other's sermons and yell at each other. And there's like all this, there's like this specific beef. But the point is they've got <laughs> enough money at some point in time, right? To They've got monasteries that are more in towns, in cities. They're not outside of cities because they're supposed to be working with people and they make their own beer too. And that's what, you this know, beer this, is. Beer, this, yeah. this beer is allegedly. So allegedly from 13, uh, 1363, apparently. Wow. See, so yeah. yeah. and that's like the beer. I don't mind a Weiss beer. I do not. I do think actually, um, not that you necessarily have a choice because it's not easy actually to join monasteries or nunneries. Uh, um, right. Like, you know, you can write all the things you want about, like, don't get married, girl, become a nun. But when you want to join a monastery or a nunnery, a lot of the time it is expected that you bring kind of like a gift of money or property to help help it. Mm -hmm. So, like, a peasant can't just be like, oh, that's it. Like, I'm going to go be a monk necessarily unless they've got the money to to do that. So it it's interesting because, like, if you think about St. Francis and his whole deal, like, the only reason all of that is impressive in the first place is because he was rich. Like, walking around in a sack because you don't have any money is not impressive if you're poor, right? It's like you're just, you're just poor, That's right? That's what everybody does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, it's only impressive if you made the choice to do it, right? So it's kind of like, mm. but on the other hand, it's a pretty good life. You know, you get to, I mean, well, you have to do rather a lot of church, but maybe you get to work in a library, you get to sit around and read things, you're making good beer, you eat fairly well, like you don't have... You don't have the same kind of like attentions about where your next meal is coming from that mm. a lot of people do. You know? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's a uh, yeah peasant peasants. I mean, we have again, we have another image of peasants from the medieval times than mm -hmm. what was more real, I suppose. Oh. But still, it was a difficult life. Mm -hmm. And well, I mean, can you argue that working class class people nowadays then don't have a difficult life? I mean, <sighs> whenever whenever you're poor, yeah. you have difficult life. So it wasn't worse. In some respects. Yeah, like, uh, it's it, it's an interesting one. That's a really good point because, don't get me wrong, like, um, being a farmer is backbreaking work, right? Like, it's, it's really, really difficult. On the other hand, um, in the medieval period, people have more time off than we do because basically the idea is, especially if you're a peasant, well, you do as much work as is needing doing and then you're done. Mm. Right. It's like no, no one is like, OK, <laughs> where it's nine to five. Yes. Like, get out there in the field and now you're done. It's like, well, you got to milk the cows. You got to feed the animals. You have to do whatever plowing there is. In the but winter, then, there wasn't. Yeah, you just chill. Yeah. Like because it's like, well, what are you what are you meant to do? Right. And so basically in the winter, it's just kind of like food, firewood, keeping the animals going. And then that's it. Yeah. And you just sit around and wait till spring. Yeah. And now there are times of year, like, for example, August, where you're going to be working really hard. Um, so, like, August and September are, like, traditionally quite uh, busy periods. But then it's, like, you're in the lead up to kind of autumn, and there's a lot of festivals, and there's a lot of hanging out. And, you know, people just have a lot of saints days off. Like, basically, it's a saint day, and it's, like, almost always a saint day. Like, <laughs> to be clear... <laughs> Like it really, and some are more important than others. And granted, not all Saint feast days are like uh, celebrated everywhere. So, for example, um, well, you would have your own cities. Yeah, right. Saint. So it's yeah. like um, you're not going to celebrate here in London. You wouldn't celebrate uh, like the feast day of Saint Venceslaus, like Czechs and Germans do. But like here, you know, they're going to like uh, they will do the what is his name Thomas More? Yeah, who gets like killed in Canterbury? They got his day off, right? And so there's ones that everybody always does, like uh, Michaelmas, which is St. Michael the Archangel's feast day. And, like, everyone is like, woo, yeah. 
love that you know like that's a that's a big one there's like that's a huge party right because it's like after the harvest and everyone's like okay ready, go, yes. ready for a break yeah <laughs> but then there is kind of like these there'll be local saints that don't necessarily get the reverence that everybody else does so yeah you'll have those days off too so you know and that's just again like make sure the animals are fed make sure everybody is fed yeah. And then and then you're good to go. So they have a really hard time. I'm not saying that they don't and I'm not saying that I would necessarily wish to do it. But we can't also like err on the side of oh it was awful and they were just toiling the whole time. I mean they yeah, they worked, but maybe not as much as us, right? Like, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. And we have to yeah, we have to it's a false uh, comparison that ah, mm-hmm. now we're better or it's easier now or you have to compare it with the period with mm-hmm. the people with their people in that period. So, mm-hmm. yeah, okay, it was a difficult life for them compared to the aristocracy and mm-hmm. the kings and the queens, of course, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But equally, in our days, we have the same problems, mm-hmm. which <laughs> we really haven't addressed uh, <laughs> equality, oh, yeah. <laughs> equality-wise. Yeah, like all the rich people now have a much easier time than we do, even though <laughs> like they yeah, don't work as exactly. hard and they have a lot more money and like whatever else, you know, so. I mean, I hesitate to call like um, eating cheese and drinking beer on a Sunday work, you know, here's you and I, like, working on a Sunday, in theory, it, right? We, you know? we are working. We are working. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, medieval people wouldn't be doing that. They'd be like, what, what is that? You know, mm-hmm. so. Mm. But yeah, I think that's a really good point. You've got to kind of put everything in context and have a look at it at, at its time. Um, because, there, of course, there's going to be a certain amount of work that needs to happen just to kind of keep the world moving. But also, there isn't the same idea... Like, from a medieval standpoint of, like, oh, you need to be working because you always have to be striving to get, like, this next thing. Because it's just sort of like, well, hey, yeah, if you can make some extra food or whatever and sell it, that'd be great. But, you know, you're, like, fundamentally, you could be a more better off peasant, but you're still going to be a peasant, right? Yeah. There, there's no there's no concept of, like, you know, quote-unquote social mobility, which is something that we love to do now is talk, talk about social mobility. And they're mm. like, no. That's not a thing. So <laughs> you gotta have some more beer, some more cheese, but yeah, that's that's about that's it. That's about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know. <laughs> and to be fair, that's a pretty good argument, but you know. <laughs> we would argue that, wouldn't we? <laughs> but the point is like if you can't if you're not even going to be able to hold it that long, right? So I guess by the fourteenth century you could be making this vice beer or whatever. Like the Franciscans and that'll hold that'll hold better. But you know, there's only so much ale you can make and then sell, right? So it's like don't work that hard. It's just yeah. gonna go off. Yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Come on. I'm totally <laughs> with this, yes. This one's really good, to be fair. Good job, monks. We like it. Mm. Granted, I've said that about all the beer, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this one's really good. This one's also really good. So hops started being um, used in, in um, UK, well, in England, mm. after 16th century yeah that's what that's what i'm given to understand so i think that after the 16th century then it was just it was over (laughs) you know like you can go ahead and wage a moral campaign as much as you like but in the first place it doesn't make any sense so So interesting so i mean yeah yeah yeah. and um and also you know there just there are just a lot of benefits to Mm. using hops which are just you know increased shelf life um better ability to ship things so if you are a brewer for example you're going to be really specifically interested in in hopping your beers because well hey then maybe you can take more to market or you can take it to a market that's further afield yeah for example yeah Yeah. and um but it is interesting because one of the things that hops does is it does kind of like signal a change away from people doing more home brewing to it being more of an operation by professionals because if it isn't like well we are going to need this this new ale like mm. every couple of days and it's going to go off. Otherwise, it's obviously in that case, it's best to make your own. But if it's going to have like a real shelf life yeah. or things like that, then and you get out of doing the work and say you're this like overworked woman <laughs> on a farm, you'll be like, yeah, great, fine, whatever. Like, yeah, let's buy it in. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So there are real benefits to it in terms of being able to make sure you've got enough beer on hand and you've still got everything that you need to keep going. But also it's like, yeah, it does signal a move away from the more cottage industries, unfortunately. Yes. And um, that changes also the way, so less women are involved in the making of yeah of beer so we have more uh... it, it does tend to be a thing that when something quote unquote professionalizes right 
So, you know, as we were talking about these ideas of women and work, it's like, well, women should be working all the time, but you know, you're not a professional, honey. <laughs> you know, it's uh, you don't you don't get to be a, a professional in this same way. So when it's like larger outfits that are doing brewing, it does move away from being a thing that women tend to do into being a thing that men tend to do. And you know, we'll see that, for example, with like various arts and things. So um we will have kind of, you know, art, for example, that we find like low status because women do it. So it's like embroidery, not that, right? you know, oh, who cares about embroidery, right? Because it's something that women sit around and do. Or um, tapestry weaving, like women in the medieval period are the major weavers. Mm. So they're the ones that are kind of like using looms all the time. But then it becomes a kind of more specialized you know, art form when more men start doing it. And when men start doing it, it's like, oh, look at these tapestries. Oh, I've done all these beautiful tapestries. You know, and basically anytime you've got two people who are doing two things, when men do it, it's like, oh, well, good job. And when women do it, it's like, well, yeah, yeah, you should be working. Yeah, you better get behind that loom. You know? And it's like, oh, you know, no one cares, sweetheart, right? Like that kind of thing. Um, and it, the same sort of thing happens with beer. So it's like, well, yeah, you should be brewing beer. That's what women do is they mm. brew beer. And then when men are doing it professionally, it's like, oh, oh, yes. Oh, this is very fancy. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's quite funny. Unless you're a, a woman. Mm-hmm. In which case, it's a lot less funny. Although I guess that our, um, our friends, the nuns, are still brewing some pretty nice beer for us. So that's all right. We like that. That's good. We do. We do. Definitely do. Actually, I know I have absolutely tons of women friends who are in beer, like brewing and selling and stuff like that. But it still is one of these things where you kind of have to carve out some room for yourself in the industry because it is yeah. pretty male dominated. Yeah. 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 Well, very interesting. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> you can go on forever with this. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yes, <laughs> I can. can. I will yeah. not stop. I will not stop. So. <laughs> I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> No, but yeah, we, we cannot really end the conversation. That's a problem. Yeah. yeah we, it's an open ended uh, thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where, in terms of when we're thinking about food now and food in the medieval period, is that is, it's a discussion that has to be ongoing because we're always learning more. And we're also always learning more about our own tastes and the idea that they are subjective in the way that our society relates to food. So, you know, how we feel about food now is different to how we felt 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 70 years ago. You know, these things are in constant flux. And the more we kind of realize that and lean into that, the more we can sort of appreciate, mm. I suppose, what's going on in the medieval period. Because it used to be that when people would talk about it, they'd be like, oh, that sounds gross. And we're beginning more and more to realize, no, it's it's just different. And there are various ways of looking at food. And they're probably really enjoyable, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. And um I think that's a, a <laughs> very good way to <laughs> to end it, I suppose. Yeah. Well, thank you so so much for having me and letting me eat all this cheese and drink all this beer. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And uh, we had some Pottage as well. We which did. Is, we had pottage is... when we started out. <laughs> oh, which was great. Really, really good because I'm always going on about it. I'm, as I was already saying, I'm always going on about pottage, which is like you know, your daily, like your daily bread in, med in medieval Europe. It's like there's always pottage going on on the stove because it's something that peasants, the peasant women, who are, you know, really run off their feet, as we say. Did you nothing. Know, yeah, you can just like throw a bunch of stuff into a pot and come back and check on it. And then you're like, oh, has the that old mutton come off the bone now? Great, I'll remove the bone. Uh, it looks like it needs some more turnips. Throw those in there. Oh, add a little bit more stock, you know, loosen it up, something like that. And then you come in from the field, you have a nice little thing of pottage and then you can wait for whatever your main dinner will be but they're working so much they have to eat all the time i am not working so much that i have to eat all the time but i got off my bike and i was immediately offered some pottage and i was like this is no i really get it like, this, <laughs> yeah. makes, this makes perfect sense was, i was like oh wow yeah <laughs> like, it was perfect i mean <laughs> it really was it just it just really took the edge off and it was like oh this is great you know so and, you know, we're all growing and changing all the time. And actually, shout out to Pottage. I love that now. That might be something that I make more often in the autumn. It's just, re it's really good. Yeah. You know, so there you go. There you go. Excellent. Tell us a bit about uh, your uh, book. Well, yes, yes. So at the moment, I have um, out uh, right now on Icon Press, a comic book, which is called The Middle Ages, A Graphic History. Uh, it'll teach you. 
about 1100 years of history in 176 pages with pictures. So excellent. You, you can't say better than that. Uh, this time next year, the once in future sex should be out. So if you want to hear me complain more about medieval women, <laughs> then you can check that out. And then otherwise, um, I blog at going hyphen medieval.com. Most weeks there's something new up. Um, and then otherwise I'm at Twitter acting a fool, um, at going medieval. Um, oh yeah. And, uh, obviously, uh, uh, you can check out my shows on history hit, which are also called going medieval. Cause I've got a really strong brand. Um, and so I've got uh, four of those and we are doing some new ones soon. So that's very, very exciting. So, um, you know, if you are interested in hearing me blather on more and more, you can always go check out a uh, history hit and just slap my name in there and some stuff will come up for you. Great. Thank you so much. And I hope, uh, <laughs> yeah, this was worth it. I would, would recommend cycling across London for cheese and beer. Try it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. And um, yeah, we'll um, talk soon. <laughs> <laughs> for Patreon backers only, we have extra content. So remember to subscribe so you can get more fascinating info about medieval cheese and beer. Thank you, once again, for listening to the Delicious Legacy Podcast. For the last few months, we've been working hard behind the scenes in order to create some food-related videos for your hungry and ravenous eyes. I'm pleased to say some progress has been made on that front. Keep your eyes and ears open. I love to hear your thoughts and responses, so please head over on Twitter and tell me what you think. You can follow the podcast at The Delicious Legacy, all one word. Or join me on Patreon, where you can put The Delicious Legacy again. One word. And that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, forward slash The Delicious Legacy. Or Google Patreon and The Delicious Legacy podcast. This podcast can only keep going with the generous support of our subscribers on Patreon. You guys keep me running, you help me cover my costs, and allow me to dedicate more time researching each episode. I want to thank all of my subscribers for helping so far to create this series. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider going to Patreon and type the Delicious Legacy podcast and contribute something and keep this podcast running. Thanks for listening. All the best. Over and out. Over and out.